And this is, uh, you know, it's just part of a, riding a commodity bull market or a gold and silver bull market is volatil- volatility. And it's usually most amplified to the downside. That's just the price price of admission. Well, that's that's my baseline expectation. I, I like to say I deal in probabilities, not predictions. And I think that's the most that's the highest probability outcome is that the uptrend holds and markets are forward looking. By the time we, we get to the news, the news actually happens. Usually not nine out of 10 times. It's already priced in. So I think the, this rate hike cycle is is pretty much fully priced in here. Um, and we're seeing that in yields. We're seeing that in metals and commodities pulling back. So I think what's about to happen next week and over the next few months is already priced in. Yes, yeah, silver, I mean, the, the chart, it's just ugly. It's You can see this sideways range going back to 2020, that peak we had. We're just right chopping right sideways, right in the middle of that range. I, w- I was encouraged here by this little arc pattern that had formed. Um, and I, I thought we we're going to run up to closer to 2850 to 30 before this pullback. Um, I was wrong on that. But, you know, we, last week, the, the first warning signal was this big bearish engulfing candle on the weekly chart. That's just an ugly looking candlestick. So that kind of signaled we might see some more weakness this week. And sure enough, we've seen that. Um, one thing that might be a little bit encouraging is we're seeing open interest kind of flooding out of silver and gold. And that indicates the, you know, the bankers are covering their shorts at a very rapid pace. Um, so I think we're pr- probably much closer to a bottom than a top here. But, you know, a little bit more weakness wouldn't surprise me in silver. Um, and j- just like gold, silver is forming its own little triangle pattern here. This is a smaller pattern. It's below its 200-day moving average, but I can see it kind of chopping sideways in here. And just like gold, this pattern will resolve by midsummer. Um, same thing for this triangle pattern. And my, my bias is, is to the upside. And I'm, I'm not a permable. If, if there were reasons to suggest it was going to go lower, I'm, I would tell you what I think. But I, I think up, I'm looking up uh, in silver, and I think we're much closer to a low than a, than a top. When it comes to the kind of buying the dip, then this might be a good time to people for people to scale more into silver. Yes, absolutely. Same comments go apply to gold that I made about the dollar cost averaging. But yeah, if you're looking to buy physical, I think this is a, a fantastic time. And junior silver mining stocks are also extremely undervalued relative to even junior silver miners are the most undervalued component of the whole precious metals complex. And I think they're presenting the most uh, attractive risk reward opportunity right now, the junior silver miners. He, by the way, since I mentioned it, here's that chart comparing SILJ, the junior silver mining ETF to GDX. You can see where we are. This is a, actually a bullish descending wedge pattern that's forming in that ratio. And once you break out to the upside, you typically get a pretty sharp move. But just if we go back to where we were in 2016 on this ratio, that would mean junior silver miners outperform GDX, the senior gold miners, by a factor of two. And I think they'll probably outperform by even a wider margin over you know uh, the next handful of years. But um, GDX, here, here's the chart for GDX. I talked about that bearish engulfing candle on uh, silver. Uh, well, GDX had its own last week, and I mean, that's just an ugly, ugly candlestick on big volume. We came down, tested the $35 support, so that's encouraging that we're holding right above that $35 level. And I, I don't have a chart for it, but the 200-day moving average is not far below either. So you've got a nice confluence of support there. Could we go back, you know, pull back just a little bit more in GDX? Certainly, but I, I think just like silver, we're probably closer to a, a bottom than the top. Now, when it comes to, I guess, investing in the mining stocks, what are some of the advantages over the physical metal? Leverage. But leverage cuts both cuts both ways. Um, you know, uh, they're much more volatile. And then there's there's a lot of additional risks too. Um, jurisdictional risk. You know, these greedy governments are are they going to are, are the mining stock are the miners going to get their permits they need? Um, are, are their drill drill results going to be as good as the the market expects? So there's all kinds of risk, but there's tremendous upside too in these mining stocks. Um, you know, I don't I don't think. I do think silver is probably going to go to 300 in the next, you know, handful of years over the longer term. But uh, I think, it, you know, if you're looking for like five baggers and ten baggers, it, it, that's where you find that kind of leverage in the junior silver mining stocks. So here's here's my um, kind of going from least risky way to play the mining stocks down to the most risky. And this is really important to know if if you're new. I think a lot of people may know these things, but I look at ETFs as kind of like the least risky way to play because you get a diversified basket. So if a couple of mining stocks fail, you know, they go to zero. Well, you've got a broad diversification. Um, the next way, safest way, and I, this is my favorite way, is um, the royalty and streaming companies. The Franco Nevadas, the Wheat and Precious Metals, the Sandstorm Gold, Golds. There's a handful of them. Um, I think they offer the second most favorable risk reward ratio. And then, of course, you've got senior producers, junior producers, explorers and developers. And one thing I see with newer investors is they're always drawn to those explorers and developers. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But 
as long as you understand the risks associated with it um, and you've done a proper cost benefit analysis, does it fit your risk profile? For me, I like to have about 20% of my portfolio in those explorers and developers. And th that's where you have your five and 10 and even 20 bagger potential, but th there's also more risk. Because a lot of people just make the assumption like, hey, you're all in on precious metals mining stocks. Um, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you've, again, counted the cost. So I think of your whole uh, financial plan or as a pie, and then you decide how much of that pie you want to be in these sectors. And then of that uh, component that you've decided to put towards precious metals mining stocks, you know, decide what, what percentage of that you want to be in, you know, top tier uh, royalty plays, senior producers, junior producers, explorers and developers. And for me, the portion of my overall financial pie that I've put into precious metals mining stocks, of that portion, I put 20% in explorers and developers. That's not right for everyone, but that, that's right for me. Yeah, the dollar has just been on a tear. And when, when you see the metals and the dollar rally in unison, like we saw recently, gold and silver, or excuse me, gold and the dollar rallying together, it's usually a sign of a, a, a fear trade, you know, uh, and we saw that with the geopolitical tensions. But look at the dollar right now on this long-term chart. This goes back to 2009. You can see the significance of this 103 area. Peaked at 103.82. That was a multi-decade decade high back in 2016. We poked our head a little bit above that just yesterday. So this is major resistance. It was getting extremely overbought. It's uh, the second most overbought in this whole time series here, going back over 10 years. So I think we're due for a pullback in the dollar. But that said, the trend is up. There's no denying that. Um, you can see this zoomed in a little bit closer on the weekly chart, just going back a couple of years, this resistance. But we're in an uptrend. That doesn't mean we're not due for a pullback. So for, for the dollar to be back in a downtrend, I'd be looking for a weekly close back below the 200-day moving average. And that's still a ways to go, but we're due for a pullback here in the dollar. And I think that'll coincide with a bounce in the metals. Yep, 100% agree with that. I, I, it's not a perfect inverse correlation. Some people think, hey, the dollar goes up, metals go down. Uh, it's not a perfect correlation, inverse correlation. Um, however, I, I, here's how I think about it. It's either a tailwind or a headwind. You can still move forward with a headwind or a rising dollar. And um, so, so it's just which, which way is the wind blowing? It's kind of how I think about it. But you're right. It, all it does is measure uh, strength of the dollar relative to a basket of five or six other uh, fiat currencies. I think six total. And the euro makes up the vast majority of that. So if you've got six currencies, fiat currencies that are all falling, losing value, but the dollar is falling a little bit less slow, it's going to show relative strength, but it's still losing purchasing power. So that, that's how I think about it. I, I don't put too much stock in it, but I track it just to see which way the wind is blowing.